Welcome back. I'm Petra Schleiter, Professor of Comparative Politics at the University of Oxford. And this is the final session of the conference on Johnson's constitutional reform agenda, co-hosted by the Constitution Unit at UCL and the Department of Politics at the University of Oxford and UK in a changing Europe. This final panel focuses on rebalancing between Parliament, the executive and the courts and takes a synoptic view of many of the issues that we've been discussing over the last two days because the wider context actually matters. In its 2019 manifesto, the government pledged constitutional reforms on an unprecedented scale to virtually every part of the UK's political system. We'll take a look at the specific proposals as they are now taking shape and consider how they jointly affect the balance between the three branches of power against the background of the government's track record to date and the challenges of Brexit and COVID. We have a brilliant panel of practitioners and academics, including Dominic Grieve QC, longtime Conservative MP until 2019, who served as Attorney General during the coalition government, Peter Riddle, Commissioner for Public Appointments and former Director of the Institute for Government, Professor Meg Russell, Director of the Constitution Unit at UCL and co organizer of this conference and Professor Tim Bale of Queen Mary University and Deputy Director of UK in a Changing Europe. We will begin with five minute opening statements from each of our speakers, followed by a discussion among the panelists of 10 to 20 minutes. And then we'll use the remainder of our time for an open Q&A session. To put a question to the panel, please write it in the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen as opposed to the chat. Don't use the chat, please. Our Q&A facilitator, Lisa James, is going to bundle those questions and put them to the panel. If you'd like to ask a question anonymously, please just tick the box to say so, and Lisa will make sure to take note. This session, including the Q&A, is being recorded and will be posted online on the websites and YouTube channels and as a podcast for the Constitution Unit and Oxford's Department of Politics and IR please do feel free to share. Okay, and that concludes my introductory remarks. And Dominic, would you like to start with your five minute outline to the panel? Dominic, you're muted. Th th thank you very much. I've really enjoyed this conference and following it because I think that the themes that have been teased out show uh, both some of the trends, but also some of the extraordinary contradictions about the discussion that we are having. Just start with the government's agenda, because I think that is what the theme of this conference is about. The government's agenda, as set out in its manifesto, and as it is now trying to deliver, and is indeed as Robert Buckland explained, is in a sense, a process of trying to set the clock back. Now, I hope I'm not being too unkind in saying this, but it's about a vision of the British state in which government, in delivering on behalf of the electorate, its electoral pledges and enjoying a majority, is effectively freed of some of the apparently irksome constraints, particularly from lawyers, uh, which have developed over the course of the last 40 years to influence the way in which government carries out its decision making. I hope that's a neat way of encapsulating how I see the issue. Therefore, whether it's judicial review or human rights or electoral law, as we heard this morning, there is a desire, apart from a few gestures like in electoral law, trying to beef up the, um, the difficulties of personating uh, a voter, a voter personation, the desire to try to reduce the bureaucratic regulatory framework in which the government tries to act. And indeed, this is absolutely in keeping with Boris Johnson's style of government. Yet, contrasting with that is the fact that the United Kingdom is no longer a unitary state as it might have been described pre uh, 1997, and even then I'm not sure it could be quite so described because it was much more subtle than that in the context of Scotland and in Northern Ireland, extremely complex. And those relationships 
on the face of it, are completely incompatible with the sort of direction of travel in which the government seems to wish to go. Because the more you simplify and the more you centralize, as John Denham was pointing out, at an English level, the more the incompatibilities of how you run a United Kingdom, which is after all on a rules-based system, just like any other international agreement, or for that matter, the EU, although the government might not like to have that brought to their attention, the more you need a rules framework and the more you need arbitral mechanisms for resolving it. And the more you need the comfort of people being able to have the sense that they know where they stand within that system and how the glitches get resolved out of it. And we have shown ourselves uniquely unable in the UK to do this. And I rather agreed with the final comments of the last panel that the chances of getting that sort of overarching constitutional reform uh, are very low. I used to give a few talks about this after I ceased to be Attorney General, saying it might be quite a useful thing to do, but I don't see at the moment the slightest prospect in terms of politics of that happening. So that then raises the question of what do we actually do? And I think there are some solutions which are pragmatic and incremental, but they do require ultimately leadership change. I didn't mean by that getting rid of the current prime minister, although that might not be an entirely unhelpful thing to do, but he is very popular with some sections of the English electorate. One has to accept that. But it does mean some significant change of thinking by UK governments about what is in fact key to being able for them to deliver on their objectives and getting away from some of the peripheral froth, such as, for example, attacks on the judiciary or on what are seen as the irksome rules under which they have to operate. And actually, I think that if they did that, they would find firstly that their relations with the, the uh, English stroke UK Supreme Court level judiciary would be much improved and levels of trust would improve. Secondly, I don't think that the English electorate would get particularly worked up about it. And second, thirdly, I think it would actually start to improve the basis of their discussions with devolved governments, and in particular with the Scottish government, which is the absolute key in all this, let's face it. Perhaps, uh, it, it that relationship is whether the United Kingdom survives or not. Otherwise, if Scotland goes, it is no longer the United Kingdom. So those are my opening thoughts for this panel discussion which I've tried to keep simple and I hope I haven't exceeded my five minutes. But there is, it seems to me, an absolute internal tension in a government agenda which is going in one direction and a country which in practical terms is going in another. And bizarrely, the government has not suggested somehow ratcheting that back, even despite the internal markets bill. So it seems to be unwilling to live with the consequences of where we are in reality today and to be harking after something significantly different, which I'm afraid I think at the moment is completely undeliverable. And if it were to be delivered, it'd be immensely damaging. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dominic. Um, Peter, would you like to go next? Yes, I, thank you very much indeed, Petra. Um, I, I, in a sense, I, I'd like to follow on some of the themes of, of Dominic. Um, as uh, bizarrely, um, I'm the practitioner, I suppose, on the panel uh, at present. I didn't expect still to be Commissioner of Public Appointments when you invited me, but I've been extended in post till September. So it constrained some of the things I say, but also actually underlined some of the themes, because I think some of the themes that Dominic has brought out of um, the uh, more unconstrained executive, um, which is the essence of it, and not just about the changes which are which are coming out of proposals from the cabinet office, but also in behaviour uh, and the operation of the current system, and that, that shouldn't be ignored. And I, I just want to, 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 to there's a central dilemma for regulators like myself, and I will talk of some other examples, which is between ministerial final say and independence of regulators. And I think there's a very fundamental point there, which has come up a number of times. I get it sometimes in, in references to political ministerial interference, which I say, hold on, a lot of the system is actually based on ministers having a final say. It's how they have the final say. And that's where changes and behavioral things matter as much as formal codes, so that they clearly matter. And the issues Dominic was raising 
uh, uh, very much so. And I think there's often be a confusion there. And if you talk to my fellow regulators on political and ethical matters, they would say that, that they face a similar dilemma. That they advise, but they don't decide. And it's that line between advising and deciding, for example, the, the debate on the ministerial code is essentially about that. And, uh, and it, it's what does advice mean? It means issues of initiation of investigations and so on. But ultimately, it's for the prime minister to decide and, 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 and that. Similarly, it arose over House of Lords appointments, where the House of Lords Appointments Commission publicly objected to one nomination by the prime minister. And he said, no, it's my decision. Now, on that, is the proper system achieved by, by having public accountability? To some extent it is. It's trying to be clear where the buck stops in this respect. And that that's also applies in my area of public appointments where it's ministers decide from a range of appointable candidates. I'm the, the guardian up to a point of the process of identifying those appointable candidates. Beyond that, it's for ministers to decide who they want. What I want to be clear is, that that line of accountability is fully clarified, that we know it's ministers deciding this, it's me ensuring that the process which produces those names is as independent and robust as possible. Not always a straightforward thing. So I think it's the, one of the key issues for me and for fellow regulators is not trying to usurp the role, the role of ministers, although behavioural changes are very important in that respect, but clarifying where the lines are and that also touches, um, I mean, uh, on another area, the activities of Parliament, which I know Meg will come on to in a, in, in a minute. But I think it's very important in that process. And I've sometimes been encouraged by it. I mean, I have a good working relationship with the Public Administration Select Committee, which is the one I'm accountable to. But I also operate with several other select committees when the controversial appointments come up so that they are clear about what is going on in the process and they can talk to ministers about what's going on. And one of my concerns at present is Parliament isn't active enough in ensuring accountability on some appointments that, you know, I write to them. I, I wrote earlier this week to um, the uh, DCMS Senate Committee about a uh, controversial appointment and it's letters public. And that, that, to my mind, is saying, right, this is what you should be aware of as issues. There's not enough of that going on. To, to everything's brought out as much publicly as possible. Just finally, can things be improved? Yes, they can be. I think on the appointment of people like me and people who, who the public would expect to be independent, I think you need a stronger independent element in the, in the process, also possibly involving parliament. Um, something Dominic will remember from the distant past, his, his former colleague, Andrew Tyree, um, uh, did a remarkable coup in 2010 on the Office of Budget Responsibility, he ensured when it was set up that the Treasury Committee would have a veto over the appointee and reappointment. Um, this horrified the, the powers that be at the time. And it was not a precedent, of course, it was an exceptional thing, et cetera, et cetera. And it hasn't been a precedent. Um, but I think that should be considered for some roles where independence is, is very important indeed in that respect. So those are my preliminary thoughts from my perspective. And I didn't want to duplicate other people's. It doesn't mean I'm not concerned about other issues, about the union and so on. But I, I think one, it's also got to look at behaviour and what um, uh, of existing uh, mechanisms as well as proposed structural changes. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. Thank you. Um, very interesting perspective on public appointments. Meg, are you going to pick up Parliament? Yes, my cat and I will do that together. Uh, <laughs> and I should start by thanking all of the contributors to the conference for such enlightening discussions. Um, earlier sessions have highlighted individual aspects of the government's attitude to the constitution, but here it's our job to draw out the general themes. The panel's title echoes the Conservative Party manifesto's words about the need to rebalance between government, parliament and the courts. It wasn't entirely explicit which direction that rebalancing should take, but in the wake of bitter parliamentary and legal battles over Brexit, it was pretty clear. Robert Buckland yesterday argued that we shouldn't interpret the government's proposals as an executive power grab. And when I pressed him on the overarching theme of its attitude to constitutional reform, he suggested that this was returning power to parliament. But many would interpret aspects of what the government's doing as the reverse. It's certainly hard to see the proposal discussed on the other panel I chaired on the repeal of the Fixed Term Parliaments Act and proposed return of the power of dissolution to the executive as anything else. 
There are other changes we weren't able to cover in the conference in detail. Peter's touched on ministerial standards and Boris Johnson's rejection for the first time in 20 years of the House of Lords Appointments Commission recommendations on propriety. I'd also add that he's appointed peers well in excess of the carefully constructed proposals of the committee established by the Lord Speaker. Like other things we have discussed, as Dominic and Peter have said, such developments point to an executive that wants to be free of constraints, to limit the various checks and balances that keep it under scrutiny, but are essential to the constitutional order. We also haven't talked much about the impact of COVID. Recently, I was co-author with others from the Hansard Society, Bingham Center on the Rule of Law and Public Law Project, of a briefing published on our blog that expressed concerns about the extent to which Parliament has been sidelined during the pandemic. That sidelining is down to government through imposing procedural changes without Parliament's consent, including shutting certain MPs out from debates, plus excessive use of emergency powers to make legal changes without seeking Parliament's prior approval, and holding pre-briefings and making announcements outside Parliament that continue to anger the Speaker Lindsay Hoyle. We're not alone in the UK in facing these kinds of challenges. COVID's global nature means governments all over the world have reached for emergency measures, sometimes in worrying ways. And none of this happens in a vacuum. It arrives on top of pre-existing international concerns about the state of democracy. It's become increasingly accepted that we can't be complacent about the robustness of democracy and constitutional checks and balances and should instead see these as fragile and in need of careful nurturing. For some people that's finally been brought home by recent events in the US culminating in January's storming of the Capitol. At that point, it becomes increasingly difficult to casually assume that it couldn't happen here. For those who haven't been following the literature on these topics, there are three books I'd particularly recommend. Levitsky and Ziblatt's How Democracies Die charts democratic decline in numerous countries. One of the key, question, key lessons I took from it was that those leaders who end up shutting down democracy don't necessarily start out with that plan. They may just be not very competent and begin gradually weakening scrutiny in order that they don't get found out. Anne Applebaum's book, The Twilight of Democracy, charts how movements on the center right of politics in Central and Eastern Europe and the US splintered between those who chose to stick with the democratic ideal and others who were prepared to compromise it to stay in power. Finally, Haggard and Kaufman's recent short book, Backsliding, which the authors summarized on our blog last week, emphasizes the key role of political polarization in allowing leaders to dismantle democratic checks. Once you believe and can convince your supporters that your opponents aren't just incorrect, but are traitors or enemies, you may get backing to lock them out of power. Although the authors weren't writing about the UK, the Brexit resonances are eerie. So the key point is we can't be complacent. Despite the UK's fine democratic history, we're as vulnerable as anywhere else. This shouldn't induce panic, but does demand vigilance. And here there may at least be some cause for optimism. Haggard and Kaufman emphasize the key role of the legislature in resisting democratic decline and warn of the risks of unquestioning loyalty in the governing party. But it would be difficult to argue just now that we have that. One of the more positive aspects of the COVID experience is that it has to a significant extent broken down Brexit polarities. Many of Brexit's strongest parliamentary supporters are now steadfastly defending the proper role of parliamentary scrutiny and in key areas, the rule of law. While those on the winning side may grow hostile to awkward interference, those who are locked out soon come to realize the benefits of checks and balances. So the more Johnson locks out his own backbenchers, the more we have to hope they'll appreciate what checks and balances are for. Thank you. Thank you so much, Meg. And Tim, can I hand over to you? Sure. Well, uh, I should start by saying I wish I shared Meg's uh, optimism, although I do share uh, the concerns that she voiced uh, a little earlier. Um, I feel I'm here slightly under false pretenses in that I know I know something about Parliament. I don't know very much about the Constitution and I certainly don't know much about the courts, but I am supposed to know something about the Conservative Party, although to call it kind of protean or chameleonic uh, 
is a bit of an understatement these days. It seems to have more changes of clothes than your average Barbie doll or, or action man in the last five years. So it's quite hard keeping up with exactly the kind of party that the Conservative Party has turned itself into. Um, the, the second thing I'd like to say, though, is, is at these kinds of events, especially organised by august institutions like the ones who've organised uh, this panel, um, you know, I like to be as calm as possible, as measured as possible, as objective as possible. Now, I think I can still be the third, but I'm not so sure I can be the first two because I am actually quite alarmed by the situation that's facing us uh, right uh, at the moment. Um, I think uh, we are in, in a pretty uh, alarming situation. When you look and wherever you look at the moment, you see a government trying to free itself, and this is something that, that, that Dominic brought up, from, from the constraints that we got used to taking for granted. Uh, and in a way, you know, our uncodified constitution almost obliges us to take for granted because uh, anything else would be, well, alarming. Uh, some examples. We've already seen in the international arena the government declaring that it would be prepared to break international law. Uh, it doesn't seem to honour Pacta Servonda. Uh, on the ministerial code, uh, we've seen the Prime Minister forgive ministers in situations which, to me, seem uh, unforgivable. Uh, we've had criticism in the courts uh, of ministers who have acted unlawfully, although of course I know that doesn't mean criminally unlawfully, uh, much as their opponents would, would like it to. Um, we've seen, uh, as Peter said, uh, it, it overriding advice on uh, appointments. Uh, it's restarted the process, for example, on the, the, uh, the head of Ofcom. Uh, we've also, um, clearly have problems with ministers misleading parliament. Um, Priti Patel, for example, on I think the Asylum Detention Centre and COVID in, in Faversham, uh, I, I think it was. Uh, and um, you could argue that in some ways what Speaker Hoyle was, was talking about when it came to the, the lifting of the, or the non-lifting of lockdown announcement uh, amounted to, to some kind of misleading, at least of him uh, anyway. And we have, uh, uh, a, a parliamentary um, spectacle every week, PMQs, which has become even more of a farce than it uh, ever was before. And that is saying something. So it's easy to scoff, I think, at the idea of you know, post-truth. Um, but I really am concerned that we're not just heading towards post-truth politics, but we're actually there uh, already. Um, I always like to kind of portray myself as someone who says, oh, we've seen this all before, you know, it's cyclical. Um, you know, when you get to my age, you know, I'm in my mid fifties, it's a sort of easy shtick, right? You know, you, you can remember stuff that went, that went before and you can draw parallels and say, there's not too much to worry about. But I think actually there is quite a lot to worry about um, at, at the moment. And what really worries me is the lack of consequences uh, for any of the government's actions. Uh, it's, I think it's kind of emperor's new clothes um, scenario that we're in. The government seems to have realised that the constitution, uh, the conventions around that constitution is basically naked and, and they can essentially do what they like as long as they've got a relatively comfortable majority, fairly sycophantic Republican Party light uh, backbenchers who, you know, put a premium on, on getting in at the next election. I know that benches have always done that, but what they'll tolerate in order to get that to happen, it seems to me, um, is, is a lot more worrying than it, than it used to be uh, before. And so as a result, I think that we're all standing there sort of shivering really, at the same time sort of boiling with anger and not really knowing quite what to do. So. Uh, you know, I would be interested to hear more about Dominic's solutions, uh, as he called them, and also what other panellists and people, you know, writing in uh, think we can do about what I regard, as I say, as quite an alarming situation. Thank you so much, Tim. And perhaps I can press all of us to think a little bit more about that. I, I, I hear very similar things from all of you. Now, yesterday, um, the Lord Chancellor noted in his opening address that governments, of course, inevitably make mistakes. 
But he also took the view that the responsibility that comes with um, power is in and of itself sufficient check. Um, it sounds to me as if not all of the members of this panel are convinced by that. Um, and my question to you was going to be, should, should his reassurance reassure us? And if not, what is to be done about that? <laughs> and who would like to go first? Well, I'm happy to go first on that. I, I happen to believe that the Lord Chancellor is a well-intentioned individual and is probably trying to moderate uh, some of the uh, manifesto pledges that were put forward um, in that manifesto uh, and feels probably that at the end of the day they may tweak um, a little bit um, the JR rules, that cart might go, um, uh, that, but it'll all be round the fringes and it won't make a significant uh, difference. Um, and I'm not sure about his view on human rights, but there too, I rather I have a sort of vague feeling that this report, particularly in view of the issues surrounding our membership of the Council of Europe, now that particularly we're out of the EU, may well even persuade the Prime Minister that this is not a good place uh, to go. So I think there is a certain slight sense of minimalism in those, in those big changes, but I agree entirely with Tim and indeed with Peter that we should be as equally worried about the serial rule breaking of the rules of propriety, behavior and conduct. The Internal Markets Bill, sorry to have to say this, the diminution of the role of the Attorney General into apparently being a mere cipher, prepared to sign off in the case of the Internal Markets Bill, a legal opinion which was utterly untenable to 98% lawyers. Um, this is all part of a package of slipperiness around the edges, which I think we should be very worried about. Now, the question, and picking up what has been said, just picking up Meg's thing about Parliament. I, parliament is key to this. Let's face it, parliamentary scrutiny is pretty abysmal, and Parliament uh, was, I'm, excuse my saying it, castrated in the late 19th and early 20th century in terms of its independent uh, operation. And it only revived very briefly over Brexit because there was a minority government. Actually, if Parliament was given more of its head, parliamentarians would take more responsibility and would actually see the advantages of a rules-based system surrounding the executive, even when they are the supporters of the executive itself. So there are lots of small things that you could do if the government wanted to, to improve overall governmental performance, but it would require government to be to abandon the grandiloquent announcement and just try to override every objection which comes along with it, which is what the trend is at the moment. So if you did those two things, I think you'd end up with a much more comfortable, leave Scotland, Wales, Northern Ireland out of it, you'd end up with a much more comfortable situation. The judiciary would start to trust the government more. Therefore, actually the government would end up with fewer cases, which started causing them trouble because the breakdown of trust has been one of the marked phenomena. Now, I, I suspect the Lord Chancellor, coming back to where you originally started, probably knows a lot about that and knows it. But he is bending with the wind and the wind coming out of number 10. And I'm not sure the interesting thing is whether it will have changed now that Mr. Cummings is gone, was definitely of a quite revolutionary nature in wanting to push these agendas forward, which I'm afraid to have to say had been quite supported by backbench conservative MPs over the years that used to pick up this conversation in the tea room. So I'm not quite sure where it will all end up. And of course, with the prime minister, you're always facing up to the fact that the question of where his personal popularity is going to be at any given moment is likely to be a major determinant of which way he jumps on which particular bandwagon of policy he thinks he needs to embrace at any time. Because it's very difficult to see that Johnsonism has much more of an underpinning than that, which makes it so volatile. Okay, can I? Kind of, I mean, I, just to um, answer your point and, and, and take on from Dominic, I don't think the, the system is self-correcting. I don't think the inherent nature of executive power um, will produce um, virtue in all cases. Therefore, you do need checks and balances. I'm not wholly 
pessimistic. I mean, I, I share many of the, the, the concerns that Tim expressed earlier. However, um, what's interesting is that in, certainly in my area, the threat of investigation, the threat of saying things publicly can have an impact. And I, I've been doing that a bit in the last few months on one or two things where I, I thought, um, um, the, 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 to put it in euphemistic terms, the envelope has been pushed, or the, the, it's the letter and the spirit of the governance code of public appointments um, is, is being stretched enormously. I've said that, and it, it has had some effect. I, I perhaps I, I'm, I'm inevitably in my own job, I, I look at little victories and little gains and exaggerate them. But there is an extent to which um, the, the, the existing regulators, whilst they can be overruled, can have some influence. So I'm not totally pessimistic. There's a very interesting report, for example, by the Committee on Science and Public Life earlier this week, which covered, the main focus was on lobbying and, and business appointments, but covered the ministerial code and my area. And um, it said some very sensible things and it addressed some of these dilemmas. So uh, it, it, it is possible to, to do that, but the key to it is having strong checks and balances. And I agree entirely with what was said earlier, that does involve uh, um, parliamentary committees. And I'm not quite as critical as Dominic on that. Parliamentary committees being more effective, taking issues up, pressing them. Some do, and as we all know, it depends on the personalities of the chairs of various committees, inevitably on that. It is possible to do it, but that is in, in the, in the non-legislative sense, um, there are opportunities to push back and to say no, and expose things. And I think exposure is very important. Of course, Dominic's right. The the uh, ministers can ignore it, ride over it. However, <coughs> they don't want to do that all the time. <coughs> Sorry, they don't want to do that all the time, and they do want to do things properly. I mean, Tim mentioned the Ofcom appointment. What was interesting there is everyone behaved exactly in line with the code. I, I, I've written a letter to the DCMS committee on that. What it said was the panel looked at the candidates, judged who was appointable and who was not appointable, and, and the Secretary of State, perfectly within his rights, said, this is advisory, don't accept the advice, so we'll have a fresh competition. That actually is following the rules. There could have been an alternative outcome. They could have decided to appoint someone who was judged unappointable. That didn't happen. And so one shouldn't underrate the extent to which options can be affected by public discussion and procedures being followed. Thank you, Petra. Thank you so much, Peter. And Meg, would you like to come in? Yeah, sure. I, I agree completely with what Peter said, that the system is not self-correcting. And that's exactly the kind of complacence that I'm warning against. And if you look at the overseas examples, I mean, maybe Robert Buckland should read the books that I recommended and it might send a chill down his spine. I mean, we all, most of us, have an inherent optimism bias. You know, we think that bad things aren't going to happen. When we go to the doctor to get a diagnosis, we don't think it's going to be us who gets the terminal diagnosis. This is inbuilt. It keeps us going. And I think it applies in the world of politics as well, that in countries where things go badly wrong, those people before they went badly wrong were not aware that this was coming. And that's why I call for vigilance. Um, Haggard and Kaufman, emphasize in their piece on our blog and in, in their book, the incremental nature of backsliding, how things happen bit by bit until you're so far into the process that you begin to realize what's happening, but you can't get out. It's the analogy of the frog in the pan of water, which is gradually being warmed up. So there's no room for complacence, I think. And although I said, I don't think there's room for panic. I also don't think that the government can be self-regulating. I've emphasized on lots of panels the, the importance of scrutiny. Scrutiny isn't just a sort of nuisance thing that gets in the way that's just there for political purposes. It's there to point out the flaws in what's going on. And as my work on parliament has emphasized, it's not so much that the government gets caught out by scrutiny necessarily. It's the fact that the government knows it will be subject to scrutiny that forces the government to look very carefully at what it's doing. So as Robin Cook used to say, good scrutiny leads to good government. And that's one of the reasons why you need these checks and balances. One thing I'd just say in, return, in, in reply to Tim and, and his um, negativity, I mean, obviously, Tim, I hope that you're not right. Um, in terms of where we are in parliamentary terms and Conservative Party terms, I mean, we've now we've had another um, um, a communication from Dominic Cummings today, just, just an hour or two ago, where he describes Boris Johnson as a gaff machine, clueless about policy and government. 
Um, I'm not sure we have been in a situation before where there is so much talent on the back benches, particularly uh, select committee chairs and so on, contrasted with a prime minister about whom people say things like that. So I think that's actually a more dangerous situation for the prime minister and his agenda than might normally be the case, even with a big majority. And of course, we've seen a by-election loss today. I don't know whether that signifies anything, uh, but when the prime minister ceases being popular, that's when the support definitely drains away. Mm. Tim, do you want to come in? Yeah, I mean, I, I do take Meg's point and I, I take um, her point particularly about select committee chairs um, on board. I mean, I think she's absolutely right that, that some of the people uh, and some of the Conservative MPs who are chairing select committees are, are very talented people, uh, very bright people, and, you know, are in a position to actually subject the government to a fair degree of scrutiny. But of course, um, you know, that scrutiny only actually makes a difference if the government has a sense of shame, has a, a fear of exposure, as, as, as Peter would put it. Once that goes, uh, I think we're in trouble. And, and that, I think, is, is where this is a rather different Conservative government from Conservative governments that we had before. Um, you know, I don't want to go back to, to the, the Thatcher era as some kind of golden age, but you certainly felt with Mrs Thatcher, you know, that she on several occasions was genuinely quite worried about what might happen to her in Parliament, um, Western being the obvious example. Uh, now, of course, that, that didn't do for her, but she was generally very worried uh, about that. And so she should have been, some, some would say. Uh, I think there is a, a, a qualitative difference, really, between the, the Conservative government that we see now and, and Conservative governments past. I'd also want to say that I, I think Meg is absolutely right about this incremental process. Um, you know, if we, if we look comparatively, when we look at backsliding, an example that's often made, and I'm sure it probably features quite heavily in, in the books that uh, she was recommending, particularly the latter two. If we look at Viktor Orban in Hungary, we have to remember that he started out as a liberal. Uh, I don't think he was necessarily always this, um, you know, um, populist strongman who we see today. Uh, I think he himself changed uh, as a result of, you know, wanting to, to gain power, to cling on to power, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so I, I think that that incremental point is, is really, really uh, well made. Um, I mean, uh, some of the tensions we're talking about are inherent in having a fused system, yes, where the, where the executive and the, is in the legislature. Um, but we've already seen, even in a, a country like the United States, where we don't have a fused system, where we have, you know, separation of powers, that, that um, actually lawmakers, to use the phrase that um, American journalists always use, can, can still actually end up uh, doing everything that the executive or at least their executive or their leadership wants them to do, uh, even if it means saying that, you know, black is white and, and white is black. Uh, and and the, the willingness nowadays of, of politicians to, to do that, um, you know, I, I'm, I'm old enough, I guess, to remember, I think is, is qualitatively different. Um, you know, I, dare I say that, that Peter might be a little bit older uh, than me, uh, and, and, and may think may think the same. I don't know, but I, I do think we are living in a different era, and it's almost as if uh, politicians have realised that they can get away with more than they used to be able to get away with. And if you allow politicians to think that, then I'm afraid they will do. Thank you so much. Um, my next question, and I hope um, we can give fairly brief answers to that because I want to get to um, questions from from our chat is about the lasting, uh, any lasting legacies, if you think there might be some from Brexit and COVID and the government's practical track record today in shaping, say, public appointments, uh, the role of parliament, uh, shaping the role of courts um, in that context. Because what we see is that a rather different government with a different approach and you know, new behaviors is acting in this very unusual situation. And so I was wondering, do you think there are going to be lasting legacies from that? And what are the implications in your view going to be for the rebalancing agenda that we see the government pushing? Um, and Meg, would you like to lead off on that? Because I think you have done some work at least on the public perception of these issues 
Sure. Yeah. Well, I referred, to, I think, to some of these things in my in my opening remarks. I mean, we, we are living in the post Brexit period and that period was got very nasty and vicious. And I think we've seen that referendums can be very polarizing. Um, they're naturally polarizing devices, especially if you end up with a near 50 50 result, and especially if you have a question uh, where the answer hasn't been worked out in advance as to what to do uh, if there's a vote for change, which left Parliament in a very difficult situation, it dragged the courts in and so on. Um, and what you began to see in that period was a polarization of opinion with respect to checks and balances along Brexit lines. So there's some very clear evidence that after the uh, second Supreme Court ruling on the prorogation, that those who supported Brexit overwhelmingly thought that the Supreme Court was wrong and should keep its nose out, and those who didn't support Brexit overwhelmingly supported the Supreme Court. And I think that's that's very dangerous. Uh, it's very damaging, and it helped to feed those commitments in the manifesto. But as I say, I think that firstly, um, COVID, I think in a peculiar way, has helped uh, because some of those who felt shut out. Uh, some of those who felt that they were sort of riding high during the Brexit times now feel that they've been shut out of Parliament. And I think that the government's treatment of Parliament under COVID has been actually pretty bad. Uh, and some very loyal Conservatives, uh, not least actually Dominic's former constituency neighbour, Cheryl Gillan, um, in the very constituency that held its by-election yesterday, were very critical of the government in its handling of Parliament, which I found remarkable because she was the most loyal person that you could wish to meet. Um, so I think that quite a lot of anger has been churned up on the back benches, and therefore we're left with quite a sort of febrile Parliament where some of those who are very much supporting uh, keeping Parliament's nose out of things are now fighting for the exact reverse. What we don't know is what the public think about this, and that's what you referred to, Petra. The unit has uh, a project which has recently begun, which people can read about on our website. It's led by Alan Rennick, but I'm part of it as well. It's called Democracy in the UK After Brexit. And we're trying to get behind some of those polarised attitudes and work out, in a sense, I mean, some, some people in the audience might recognize if I say, if you're behind the veil of ignorance, you don't know whether the government that you, the government that's in is one that you support, the policy that it's trying to promote is one that you support. What do people think actually are the principles of how the system should run? To what extent do they want the parliament to be constrained? What do the, the government to be constrained? What do they think is the proper role uh, of the, judi the judiciary and, par and, and parliament and regulators? And we're doing uh, a big opinion poll on that. And we're gonna be holding a citizens assembly on it in the autumn. And I think actually COVID may have quite fundamentally affected people's attitudes on these things, but, but we will see. Peter, Dominic, or Tim, would you like to come in on this question? Uh, yes, I, I, I'm happy to. I, firstly, Brexit has obviously contributed to this. And I, I think you know, I have to look at my own responsibility. You look at what happened and the, the crisis of the summer of 2019. Boris Johnson, leader of the Conservative Party, he becomes prime minister. And I think the next seven votes in Parliament, he loses. Um, he resorts to draconian and crazy decision of uh, proroguing parliament. Um, and he loses that partly because he's lied about his motivation. He's unable to produce an affidavit explaining the reasoning. And he lies actually about when he, when he, was, he was planning to do it. Um, and it looks as if the government could be completely on the ropes. He then does a tremendous Houdini trick. He does a deal with Mr. Varadkar. The Taoiseach, uh, which has subsequently he shows every sign of not wishing to honour. He holds a general election. Uh, he has it on the theme of him against Jeremy Corbyn. Corbyn is unelectable. He gets a thumping majority and he escapes. So I don't think we should be altogether surprised if one tries to view it through his prism, that the, the sense that Parliament is an irksome uh, and dangerous fetter on the executive may have got quite well implanted in his DNA, particularly as, in my view, he belongs to a group of politicians, and he's not the only one, who, although they may be in Parliament, I don't think they have any regard for Parliament as an institution whatsoever. And I can think of many others. Uh, <laughs> just Parliament is just one of those things which happens to be, I don't think, pay any real attention 
to whether parliament has an institutional importance, apart from the fact that it provides them with the majority they, they want. And I have to say, the other person who I don't think had very much interest in parliament as an institution was David Cameron. Uh, I, I don't mean that hypocritically of him, but I just don't think he did. Uh, and I can think of others, some politicians do. Um, so that combination, I think, goes a long way to explaining some of the government's approach to governance over the last 18 months. Now, I also agree with Meg. I think COVID has shown that there are many, that the, the leave remain split has started to break down. I mean, I cooperated in writing an article with Steve Baker about what the government was doing over COVID. Steve is a very old friend. Uh, he is an undoubtedly a good parliamentarian and he is uh, was very pro league. Uh, but we were able to cooperate and do that three months ago because he felt so concerned about the way the government was handling COVID and marginalizing parliament. So it may be that this is a, a tipping point where parliamentarians start to feel um, that they're being neglected and they want to enhance their status. And as I say, I think it would be wonderful if the government, a government did come in, which was prepared to enhance parliamentarian status, give parliament a bit more, more control of the order paper, for example, because that would actually start making their scrutiny role operate better, thus delivering the very thing which Robin Cook said was ultimately to the advantage of government, rather than just being there to turn up and vote, or nowadays, in fact, to vote by pressing a button from their home, which is even worse. Um, so I, I'm not sure that these are permanent trends, but I have to say that I think they're permanent features of Johnsonism, and I find it very difficult to see how people have often said Johnson is going to do a somersault. They said that Cummings' departure was going to be a somersault moment. Well, I haven't seen real signs of that at the moment. So I'm afraid I think until Johnsonism has worked its way out of the system, we are not going to see a significant change of direction. And of course, if Johnsonism turns out to be hyper successful, uh, then it won't happen at all. But I have my doubts about that. And I think that the by-election result in Cheshire and Amersham, which adjoins my old seat, is quite a telling indication that a section of the conservative loyal voting public are really troubled by the general behavior of this government, much more than about COVID or HS2 or planning regulations. They just don't like the smell. And that's what I've been picking up from people who live in that constituency. So I think it's quite an important sign uh, of a lack of confidence in the general trend of government that he's delivering, but whether that will lead to changes in the area we're discussing, I have no idea. Thank you so much, Dominic. Lisa, can we go to questions? I see we have about, we have quite a big number of questions by now. Uh, yes, we do indeed. Um, wonderful. Um, and in fact, uh, I would like to start with a pair which directly pick up on what Dominic has just said. Uh, we've got two quite opposing takes from the audience um, on what we can tell about how far the public is interested in the kinds of things that the panel's been discussing. Uh, so Paul Tyler, the political reform spokesperson for the Liberal Democrats in the House of Lords, um, suggests that feedback from Chesham and Amersham suggests that at least some of the electorate now share these constitutional concerns with the panel like to comment. Uh, but an anonymous attendee has written in to put the opposite perspective, um, saying that Peter says that public exposure and discussion matter, but how much? Has the gov government not realised that on almost all these issues, public exposure doesn't make a difference because the public has better things to do than follow Westminster process, allowing the government to 